infantry. He was thoughtful, intense, and entirely dedicated to the seriousness of his craft. Well, if you talk to a fiction writer, you're going to get a prejudiced view. There's something magical for me about literature and fiction, and I think it can do things not only that pop culture can't do, but that are urgent now. One is that by creating a character in a piece of fiction, you can allow a reader to leap over the wall of self and to imagine himself being not just somewhere else, but someone else in a way that television and movies, that no other form can do. Because people, I think, are essentially lonely and alone and frightened of being alone. At the time of that interview, David Foster Wallace had published two books in the US, a novel, The Broom of the System, written when he was still a student, and a brilliant collection of short stories, Girl with Curious Hair. In 1996, Wallace more than fulfilled his early promise when he produced Infinite Jest, a thousand-page encyclopedic novel that came trailing clouds of glory and 388 endnotes. Moving between a tennis academy for the elite and a halfway house for the desperate, the novel is set in a near-future capitalist dystopia where even the years have been sponsored by corporations, the year of the whopper, for instance, or the year of the depend adult undergarment. Infinite Jest attempted nothing less than to survey the addictions of an entire culture, to television, to alcohol, and to prescribed and non-prescribed pharmaceuticals of every variety. Above all, Wallace addressed his great theme, the self-consuming solipsism of a culture crying out for community. One of the really American things about Hal is the way he despises what it is he's really lonely for. This hideous internal self, incontinent of sentiment and need, that pules and writhes just under the hip-empty mask and hedonia. No 281. This has been one of Hal's deepest and most pregnant abstractions, one he'd come up with once while getting secretly high in the pump room. That we're all lonely for something we don't know we're lonely for. And to explain the curious feeling that he goes around feeling like he misses somebody he's never even met. Without that universalizing abstraction, the feeling would make no sense. In the years that followed his epic work, Wallace would self-consciously downsize in scale, though not ambition, producing two innovative, darkly funny and disturbing collections of short fiction, brief interviews with hideous men and oblivion, and two collections of essays and journalism that won him a wider audience but retained much of his singular style, a combination of streetwise slacker ease with arcane references and scholarly appendages, recursive loops and linguistic curlicues all buttressed by his signature footnotes. Rick Moody. There's always a way in Wallace to take whatever's just been said and to kind of subdivide it and then probe at the fragments that, that are sort of underneath. And to me, that's what the footnoting's about. No thought is complete until eight more subheadings are appended to it in some way. A few years ago, I wrote a literary history of America. I stopped at the generation before Wallace's the generation of Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo. As all literary scholars perhaps should, I allowed myself a pregnant pause before advancing any further, a chance for posterity to do its thing. But I was convinced that in any subsequent account of American writing, the work of David Foster Wallace would loom large. Along with many others, I looked forward to tracking the development of this most intrepidly adventurous of writers, and, along with many others, I was shocked and dismayed when, in 2008, Wallace, who we learned had suffered from depression for years, hanged himself at the age of 46. The loss of the finest writer of his generation has meant that Wallace's work is being poured over with accelerated attention and urgency. Posterity has been induced. The reputation will be the focus of even more intense attention in April, when his unfinished novel, The Pale King, is published. It's hard to think of a recent serious novel that has been more eagerly anticipated. How The Pale King will affect that reputation is difficult to foresee, but what seems certain is that Wallace, even in his last moments, wanted to ensure that at least some of the novel he struggled with for many years would see the light of day. He certainly left a manuscript sitting on his desk in his office so that it would be found. 
Wallace's agent and now literary executor, Bonnie Nadell. While some writers, like Kafka, seem determined that their unpublished work will perish with them, this was emphatically not the case here. He had told his wife, destroy things that you don't think are any good. It wasn't destroy everything. It was destroy things if you don't think they're good. When Karen and I started going through his office, which was the garage next to his house where they lived in Claremont, I mean, first of all, it was the spookiest, most haunted room I think I've ever been in in my entire life. It just felt awful to be there and to be doing what we were doing, and we were so shell-shocked at the time. But, I mean, we both knew that we'd found a manuscript and we'd found pages. And then we started opening up these plastic containers that he used to keep books and notes and manuscripts and notebooks in. And we just kept finding more and more and more pages. But, I mean, the first batch, which was about 200 clean typed pages were very much sitting on the desk if there could have been a spotlight on them you know to say here it is there would have been but it was sort of everything but that much of the media attention around wallace has understandably if regrettably focused on the grim fact of his suicide and the depression that led up to it but wallace is far too various a writer to be medicalized his work is too complex for easy diagnosis Wanting to get a deeper sense of the intellectual formation of the writer, I travelled to the Midwest of America, where he grew up. Wallace was the son of intellectuals, his father an eminent philosopher, Wittgensteinian and teacher of ethics, his mother a distinguished grammarian. As a boy, David was a prodigy in many ways, conducting Socratic dialogues with his father at an unfeasibly early age, and manifesting a precocious interest in logic, grammar, geometry and algebra. As your train slices through the flat landmass of Illinois, you get the peculiar sense that this most globally ambitious and cosmopolitan seeming of writers might, in a strange way, be a regional writer too. A sense that this place shaped his love of geometry, his straight angles, his very American sense of large spaces. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this train does terminate in Champaign-Urbana. All passengers will be asked to leave the train in Champaign and board buses if they're going down the line to any other station stops down the line. Once again, Randy I was guided around Champaign by Amy Wallace, David's sister, and the dedicatee of his first novel. Together, we toured the flatlands, town grids, and cornfields of Champaign-Urbana. There's a sense of endless space running to the horizon. There's also sometimes, well, quite often, a very geometrical element to the space. And we know that David was very drawn to geometry, mathematics, logic. Does it predate his interest in literature? I know that David loved problems and he loved logic and he loved things that were indisputable. But I think math appealed to him because he did grow up where everything is right angles, the streets don't wind around here, you come to an intersection, it's, it's 90 degrees. He played tennis on a rectangle with very carefully cordoned off areas. I think that he realized only when he started writing and also being more engaged in philosophy and modal logic, how much geometry had been around him his whole life and how much he'd sort of ordered himself within it. Tennis is a constant in the life and work of David Foster Wallace. Infinite Jest is set, in large part, at a tennis academy whose students are stricken with performance anxieties of various kinds. A tennis ball is the ultimate body, says a character in the novel. Use well or poorly, it will reflect your own character. Ever the prodigy, Wallace himself was a highly ranked player as a youngster and even took his first practice shots at storytelling at courtside. When David and I were kids, the Urbana Park District gave tennis lessons for kids and rapidly became clear that David was very good at tennis. Then as he grew up, he was good enough that he then became the tennis instructor. And we're standing right next to the courts where David would teach tennis lessons, but with the kids, if they resisted his attentions to the point where he became frustrated, if the kid wasn't getting it, he would threaten, look, you, you fluff that shot one more time and you're going to have to hear my life story. Then they would sit under, I believe it's this very tree, and David would 
tell a chapter of his life story. And it, it did then become apparent that this was sort of counterproductive as a strategy. And the kids enjoyed sitting under the tree and hearing about David's improbable life story. I, I don't know if he's ever told them anything true or not. In terms of region, we're in what I believe meteorologists term Tornado Alley, where it must have been pretty hazardous to play tennis. David writes of Midwestern life being, quote, informed and deformed by wind. What are your memories of this? <laughs> well, that's certainly true. There's nothing much to buffer the wind. Tornado season runs anywhere from probably March through September. Tornado sirens never went off at some civilized hour. It would always be one or two in the morning. David was fascinated by tornadoes. When the tornado sirens would go off, you're supposed to go down to your basement, but my parents, being Easterners, did not buy a house with a basement. So when the sirens would go off, we, we would huddle in a hallway downstairs, and you're supposed to sit there until you get the all clear with your little battery charged radio, and David would jump up and go outside and look around, and my mother would say, get back here, David, and he, he would, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll see it before it picks me up. In an early autobiographical essay, Wallace records the recreational hazards of playing tennis in tornado country. Then the whole knee-high field to the west along Kirby Avenue all of a sudden flattened out in a wave coming toward us as if the field was getting steamrolled. Antitoy went wide west for a forehand cross, and I saw the corn get laid down in waves and the sycamores and a copse lining the ditch point our way. I seem to remember whacking a ball out of my hand at Antitoy to watch its radical west-east curve, and for some reason trying to run after this ball I'd just hit. But I couldn't have tried to run after a ball I had hit. But I remember the heavy gentle lift at my thighs, and the ball curving back closer, and my passing the ball and beating the ball in flight over the horizontal net, my feet not once touching the ground over fifty-odd feet. If Wallace is, in a weird way, a regionally specific writer, he is like no other. Often he translates the great Midwestern outdoors, or the joys of tennis, into mathematical or scientific terms. He attended Amherst College, intending to major in philosophy and maths. The shift toward creative writing only occurred around the time he was treated for the depression that would dog his adult life. As far as I know, David didn't start writing until after his first bout with depression. He went off to college, I think, believing he was going to be a philosophy major, which, well, he was. And then he had a horrible bout with depression and certainly changed after that. It seasoned him in a way most people that age don't become seasoned made him aware of depths of pain that most people never have to endure. And also, once it was gone, the exhilaration at being able to function again and really realizing that it's a gift to be able to use your brain to create and not to turn in on yourself. At college in Amherst, and later in Boston, Wallace roomed with Mark Costello, who was to become one of his closest friends and co-author of a book on rap they did together, Signifying Rappers. I met Costello, a lawyer turned acclaimed novelist himself, in New York. He saw the first flourishing of Wallace's creativity as his friend published his first two books, and the first onset of depression. Yeah, I mean, the two things are related. I think Dave wanted to be many things other than an artist. I think it was something that was forced on him at some level because... You know, he had some collapses and he had to kind of build a new way out of it. So they were closely related and he would have a breakdown and then he'd have an explosive jump forward. And he also begins to mind depression as a subject, doesn't he? It gives him something at the same time as it shuts him down in another way. Warily, yes. I mean, he was terrified of it as a swallowing subject. He wrote a story called The Depressed Person, which I'm sure you know, which is almost Poe-like in its circularity and its closed-offness, while at the same time... It's Dave's voice, so it offers this sense that, you know, as with Joyce, language can be infinite, it can do anything, and yet the story is this very tightly constructed space that you can't get out of. You know, he didn't have much choice but to write about it, but I think he was scared of it as a subject because of its swallowing quality. So you knew him at the time of his first novel and his first stories. 
Now, he subsequently would run that early work down and dismiss it, but to me, and it seems that all the gifts are there right from the outset, particularly oh, the stories. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the book that's hardest for me to even touch is Girl with Curious Hair. They might have been suicide. I think when people go back 100 years from now and talk about you know, a generation of writers, I think they're going to go to that collection the same way that people go to Tales of the Jazz Age by Fitzgerald. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. It's a novella, really. It's in that collection. Uh, the key line is, you are loved. I and mean, it's an incredibly tender story. People think of him as a sort of a brain writer and a smart writer, and of course he was. But I mean, to me, one of the big moves in Dave, and one of the big things that he matures to is he's talking about why we can't live alone. As much as it pains us to be together, we can't be alone. We all have our little solipsistic delusions ghastly intuitions of utter singularity. That we are the only one in the house who ever fills the ice cube tray, who unloads the clean dishwasher, whose eyelid twitches on first dates. That only we fashion supplication into courtesy. That only we hear the whiny pathos in a dog's yawn, the timeless sigh in the opening of the hermetically sealed jar, the minor D lament in the vacuum scream, that only we feel the panic at sunset the rookie kindergartner feels at his mother's retreat. That only we love the only we. Solipsism binds us together. So this tension or maybe just movement happens throughout all this work between Baroque style and innovation and experiment and love, people, directness, emotion. Absolutely. You know, you can pick one of these famous 75-word sentences, and, and there's 10 different tonalities in those sentences. He invites great readings because it's almost like you're going along the wall tapping it with a hammer to find the hollow spots, and it's one sentence. Infinite jest is a struggle between the two forces that clash in much of his work. On the one hand, the loneliness and solipsism of addiction, and on the other, the empathy and fellow feeling of community, the desperate need to get beyond the self. I think some of the inspiration obviously came from the halfway house in Boston. Bonnie Nadell. I think he met people he would not have met otherwise in his life, and he saw people go through all sorts of hardships. And because of that, I think he did see a sense of community he might not have otherwise seen. I mean, David was always writing his way out of loneliness and writing his way into talking to other people. So I think it was hearing people tell stories and learning that people can tell stories in all sorts of ways and that the people, whether in AA or NA or in the halfway houses, were telling stories in the best way they knew how. Gately's found it's got to be the truth is the thing. He's trying hard to really hear the speakers. He stayed in the habit he developed as an Ennett resident of sitting right up where he could see dentition and pores with zero obstructions or heads between him and the podium. So the speaker fills his whole vision. The thing is, it has to be the truth to really go over here. It can't be a calculated crowd pleaser. And it has to be the truth, unslanted, unfortified, and maximally unironic. An ironist in a Boston AA meeting is a witch in church. Irony for his own. In Wallace's fiction, irony is the enemy. A once useful tool, it is now ubiquitous and empty, co-opted by TV and crass entertainment. Authenticity and sincerity have receded from our sight, but must be recovered somehow. Say 40 or 50 years ago, the big priority, if you wanted to be a reasonably decent fiction writer, was you didn't offend people. David Foster Wallace. As far as I can tell, for my generation and maybe the, the kids younger than us, there are different things that we're afraid of. We're afraid of being trite. We're afraid of being sentimental. We're afraid of being mawkish. We're afraid of being stale and formulaic, unless we are stale and formulaic in a way that pokes fun at its stale formulaic quality. I mean, we have been taught so much, both by the lessons of television and the saturation of television, what are the things to be afraid of? And one of the big reasons why irony, I mean, it's been the kind of the mode of discourse in the culture for the last 30 years, has really ceased to be palliative or helpful, is that irony is this marvelous carapace that I can use to shield myself from seeming to you to be naive 
or sentimental or to buy the lush banalities that television gives, right? If I show you that I believe that we're both bastards and that there's no point to anything and that I was last naive at about age six, then I protect myself from your judgment of the worst possible flaw in the sentimentality and naivete, the way a proper appearance of decorum would shield me from your judgment of me as, as deviant or offensive 30 or 40 years ago. And there, I can't quite figure it out, but TV and popular culture have, I think, everything to do with that shift of what's the fundamental stuff that we're scared of, not just as people and as writers, and what techniques do we use to shield one another from judgment. Novelist Rick Moody, like Wallace, part of a generation of writers immersed, drenched in popular culture, was one of those who responded to Infinite Jest's catalogue of addictions. It spoke very directly. I mean, that's frankly an area where David and I, to the extent that we were more than mere acquaintances, had a meeting of the minds because my experience was like his experience and to me infinite jest is just an incredibly brilliant prose work unless it has that register that was why i loved the book first i mean i happened to totally respond to his prose style and the whirls of prose and doubling back in all of its pages but what really speaks to me above and beyond that is the addiction theme the will you call your own ceased to be yours as of who knows how many substance drenched years ago. It's now shot through with the spidered fibrosis of your disease. His own experience's term for the disease is the spider. You have to starve the spider. You have to surrender your will. You have to want to surrender your will to people who know how to starve the spider. Note 139. Volunteer counselor Eugenio Jean Martinez favors entomologic tropes and analogies, which is especially effective with brand new residents fresh from subjective safaris through the kingdom of bugs. The book set in an imminent future where everything has become totally commodified, so even dates, year of the depend adult undergarment and so on. And as someone who's written his own dystopic future novels, how do you read Infinite Jest now? in terms of where we are now. That predictive layer to me is always an allegorical layer, so you're always really writing about whatever time you're operating in. That said, I think the sort of commodification register of Infinite Jest, that layer of motif is dramatically right on. And, you know, the 15 years since it came out have done nothing to diminish the savagery of that particular attack. He was right on. And if anything, things have gotten worse. One thing that's really important for me about this work, and it's a reason why I think it's really going to last, is that the political novel in American contemporary literature just has no teeth right now. There aren't really political novels, but there is a sort of savage rebellion at the heart of what was taking place in that book with respect to politics and culture. And that's why it's the book that toppled Updike and Roth and Joyce Carol Oates and made my generation be at the center of American literature because it sort of goes at things with a real political hunger to try and render the inequities of American culture. He was a man in direct confrontation with the culture, and I think that explains much of his work. The writer of the previous generation most admired by Wallace the precursor who exposed both the seductive come-ons and the final hollowness of a media-saturated culture most brilliantly was Don DeLillo. Wallace wrote to DeLillo after Infinite Jest appeared and they corresponded regularly. In New York, DeLillo told me about the affinity they shared. In Wallace's case, what I really found was a new voice, a quite interesting and new way of writing sentences and paragraphs and in general, and I, maybe this is the crux of his work, the way in which his fiction encounters the enormously complex spin-out culture around us, almost reflected sentence by sentence in his work. I've sometimes thought that the kind of roller coaster sentences he writes are inspired and meant to reflect the world around us simply in its complexity and its enormous stimulus every tenth of a second, wherever we are, anywhere on the planet. To me, his work will always seem 
youthful, even when a particular character is in some sort of emotional distress, is feeling a certain kind of self-hatred, perhaps. Wallace was youth and doubt. From the very first sentence he published until the last sentence he published. There is no way Kate Gompard could ever begin to make someone else understand what clinical depression feels like. Not even another who is herself clinically depressed. Because a person in such a state is incapable of empathy with any other living thing. If a person in physical pain has a hard time attending to anything except that pain... Note 282. The big reason why people in pain are so self-absorbed and unpleasant to be around. The clinically depressed person cannot even perceive any other person or thing as independent of the universal pain that is digesting her cell by cell. Everything is part of the problem, and there is no solution. It is a hell for one. Depression, anxiety, sadness, as you say, was a, a key word with him. And I wonder to what extent he's taking us into his own sadness and to what extent he's managing to take us somewhere else, to turn the sadness on its head, to use it creatively. I received a letter from Dave shortly after he finished writing Infinite Jest. And in it, he said that this was the most serious work he'd ever done, and he thought the best work he'd ever done. However, he was upset over the fact that he did not feel the pleasure he ordinarily feels in writing fiction. He wondered about this lost pleasure, and he used such strong terms in his letter as dread and terror. And I don't think he was exaggerating. I, I think his sensitivity, his nerve ends were such that this is precisely what he felt. And I think this is reflected in some of the, the experiences of characters in his work. There's a profound ambivalence in his work about popular culture, I guess, but TV in particular, there's that essay about the position of the writer in, in an age which is dominated by TV. And I suppose he's saying that one of the writer's great resources, irony, has been hijacked when, when everything on TV from Letterman to Lost comes pre-drenched in irony. I think Dave absorbed television as few people do. I'm not sure how deeply distressing this medium became for him and how he felt he had to write a kind of overarching fiction to both contain what's implied in 24 hours of daily TV and to transcend it. Infinite Jest treats the entertainment industry as the most dangerous drug of all. Its main MacGuffin is an entertainment cartridge so alluring that when watched, it robs its viewer of the will to do anything else. In his BBC interview, Wallace was passionate about the need for the writer to engage with pop culture. Those of us who write partly as a subject about popular culture are, I think, doing something important, which is that television and popular culture has become so saturated for people our age that we don't notice it's there. We don't notice that much of our experience isn't mediated, but it's got an agenda, right? It's trying to sell us things. That an attempt to, I don't know what you would call it, get behind the scenes, humanize, defamiliarize the experience of a mediated world is, I think, a good and important thing. If nothing else, to slap people kind of unpleasantly across the face and say, there may not be something wrong with six to eight hours of television, but it would be very nice for you to remember that you're essentially being offered a sales pitch and a, and a seduction six to eight hours a day. If we forget that, then for some reason, just intuitively, I think we're in huge trouble. At a time in the U.S., I think when it's very hard to find and commit to things that you think are important or good, at least for me, in some elements of fiction, it seems to me it's a rather high-minded agenda to try to wake people up to the fact that our experience is weird now. <laughs> There's something weird and thrice removed from the real world about it, and a lot of us don't realize it. What's at stake is, in many ways, human agency about how we experience the world. Would I rather go muck around in the hot sun by the seashore or watch a marvelously put together documentary about the death of egrets? But by the time I go to the goddamn seashore and have seen the egrets, I have already experienced the smooth documentary so many times that it becomes quickly incoherent to talk about an extra mediated or an extra televisual reality. Now, that fact in and of itself is frightening. 
And it's that kind of almost just sort of shooting a flare into the sky and inviting people to say how weird that is. I can go to the ocean that I've never seen before, but I've spent a thousand hours. I mean, it's who would want to live when you can watch? The community life of AA, NA, and the halfway houses he visited and researched gave Wallace the building blocks for a model of community. He was to find others through his teaching. In the 1990s, he returned to Illinois, to the splendidly named town of Normal, which at that time was anything but. Publishers like Dolkey Archive Press were setting up home there, dedicated to promoting innovative fiction from around the world. The Unit for Contemporary Literature was being created at the University of Illinois to provide a haven for left-field writers and Wallace was hired to teach creative writing. In Normal, I met Curtis White, a novelist, critic and teacher, whom Wallace called a mentor. He recalls a time when Normal became a kind of counterculture in the cornfields. One of my purposes here when I was hired as a creative writer was to remythologize Normal and to make it a center in some sense of contemporary fiction, or especially of the fiction coming out of the American postmodern. So we had quite an interesting literary context here when David was hired in 1993, and, and David was well aware of that context. David was here for a very particular reason. He really wanted to be here. There was a confusion in David's work that David helped foster himself in large part because he claimed quite publicly that he was moving away from the postmodern, even though it was obvious to anybody who read his work that he was very much in its tradition. In some ways, David was taken up as part of the a very national conversation about moving away from the experimental or the self-indulgent, the narcissistic writing of the postmodern writers towards something that is more quote-unquote, human. And David often used that kind of language. But for us here, we just looked at those statements and kind of laughed because it was so obvious to us. Well, for one reason, simply because David chose to be here, that he was really quite comfortable still in that sort of playful, innovative, postmodern tradition. Though he satirized postmodern forebears like John Barth and other exponents of metafiction, his work has more in common with them than it does with the more realistic writing he claimed to admire. He once wrote that his work wasn't realistic and it's not metafiction. If it's anything, it's meta the difference between the two. He seems genuinely to have been seeking not a compromise, but an evolving, self-questioning synthesis. A third way for fiction. He would love to have written like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, but he was so much aware of the history of fiction that he knew he couldn't. And so what he was trying to do was have it both ways. Charles Harris was head of the department that lured Wallace to normal Illinois. A key shift is that whereas in Barth, self-referentiality is almost always calling attention to the text. So you're never allowed to forget that you're holding words in your hand, not a world. In David's work, the self-referentiality reflects the work of the consciousness trying to rid itself of itself and constantly second-guessing itself. So there's a psychological edge to it. Now, it's there in Barth as well, but in David it becomes dominant. This is literally about one trillionth of the various thoughts and internal experiences I underwent in those last few hours. And I'll spare both of us recounting any more, since I'm aware it ends up seeming somewhat lame. Which, in fact, it wasn't. But I won't pretend it was fully authentic or genuine either. A part of me was still calculating performing. And this was part of the ceremonial quality of that last afternoon. Even as I wrote my last note to my sister, Fern, for instance, expressing sentiments and regrets that were real, a part of me was noticing what a fine and sincere note it was, and anticipating the effect on Fern of this or that heartfelt phrase, while yet another part was observing this whole scene of a man in a dress shirt no tie, sitting at his breakfast nook, writing a heartfelt note on his last afternoon alive. So his primary concern always is with traditional values. Write a fiction that was technically up to date and that actually went a step beyond the postmodernist and yet satisfied the, the same traditional need for values that he subscribed to. The unfinished, much-anticipated novel, The Pale King, 
searches for some kind of way out from boredom, drudgery, the prison of self, some path toward transcendence. In the New York offices of Little Brown, I met publisher Michael Peach, who has been Wallace's editor since he won the bidding war for Infinite Jest, saying he'd rather edit the book than breathe. His office was filled with stacks of research material Wallace had used for his work in progress. Books on accounting, IRS instruction manuals from the 1980s. A horde of leaden, bureaucratic tedium that only a mind like Wallace's could ever contemplate alchemizing into literary gold. Michael Peach told me about the formidable task of assembly involved in making these last fragments into a book. The task of assembling the Pale King was grievous at first, then it was exhilarating. The great surprise to me when I began working on it was the joy I felt being in the presence of a world that David had made and seeing how fully he had made it. I had no knowledge of this book before he died. I'd heard from his agent, Bonnie Nadell, just a few sentences. She said he's writing a book about accounting. He's, she said he was writing a book about boredom. She said he was writing about the IRS and had been taking advanced tax accounting classes. Those are the only things I knew about this book. And I was waiting. <laughs> and then I entered this landscape, which was not just a world that he had made, but a world that he had made himself a character in. So I was shocked as I began reading these pages, just five months after he died. And there he was on the page. It was a joy to see the work that only he could have done. One of the many fascinating aspects of working on this was determining what was part of the novel because as it emerged, there are s chapters in this novel which are just stories of childhoods from extremely difficult, bizarre childhoods. It gradually emerged that these are the childhood stories of the characters who in the present moment of the story are working in this IRS tax return processing center in Peoria, Illinois. Eventually I came upon a chapter in which one of these childhood characters was an adult and working in the IRS. Ah, that's what's happening here. We're clearly developing a single central story. Characters arriving in Peoria on a particular day in 1985, going into an orientation session and learning about the world of work that they're going to be entering, which is a world of vast boredom. And part of their onboarding process is tedium survival training. Lane Dean summoned all his will and bore down and did three returns in a row and began imagining different high places to jump off of. He felt in a position to say he knew now that hell had nothing to do with fires or frozen troops. Lock a fellow in a windowless room to perform rote tasks, just tricky enough to make him have to think, but still rote. Tasks involving numbers that connect to nothing he'll ever see or care about. A stack of tasks that never goes down. And nail a clock to the wall where he can see it, and just leave the man there to his mind's own devices. So it moved from being what must have seemed initially an editor's worst nightmare, you know, here's the great new novel from the voice of his generation, and his subjects are boredom and the IRS. But then it becomes apparent that there's much more depth to it, that boredom leads somewhere. Is this the great white whale that this vast novel is chasing, or is boredom a hook on which to hang other kinds of story? David loved to set himself enormous challenges. Elmore Leonard famously said, I became successful when I learned to leave out the parts that readers skip. David was thinking about the fact that most of our lives are made up of boring bits. Most of our lives are what he calls irrelevant complexity things that you just do again and again and your brain learns to go elsewhere while you're doing them. And, and most novelists just avoid them. They just compress around the exciting bits. He begins this novel by saying, remember those pages of fine print you skipped over on the way to this page? Go back and read that page called the copyright page and here's why you have to read the copyright page. And actually makes it a, a really funny part of the novel about how his publisher is forcing him to publish this true story as fiction that in fact it's all true. From what little I've seen, The Pale King contains Wallace's trademark breadth of vocabulary, his ability to elevate jargon to the heights of poetry and indeed the heights of comedy. But in what ways do we see a development from the earlier books? The Pale King, on first blush, has a lot of similarities to Infinite Jest. There are the wonderful footnotes right there in the opening scene. There is a structure that similarly you have to take in and accept before you gradually understand how they fit in the story. It would be against human nature for people to read the novel that he left unfinished without looking for 
ideas about his state of mind as he was writing it. And, and there's no question that he was struggling with severe depression. I did not know the extent of his condition or the, of his medication. He kept that entirely private. People will look for that. They'll see, I believe, a, a heroic struggle on these pages. Someone grappling with issues of life and death, like how can one live, was what he was asking himself. And that's what this book is asking, and it's a terrifying question. In a way, the novel, I think, comes home. He's, it, the novel is full of this really detailed love of the Midwest, this landscape of Illinois that, that was inside of him. He goes to great extent to show the beauty of what's thought of as the most ordinary part of America. Past the flannel plains and blacktop graphs and skylines of canted rust, and past the tobacco-brown river overhung with weeping trees and coins of sunlight threw them on the water downriver, to the place beyond the windbreak, where untilled fields simmer shrilly in the a.m. heat. Shatter cane, lamb's quarter, cut grass, saw briar, wild oat, vetch, butcher grass, invaginate volunteer beans, all heads gently nodding in a morning breeze like a mother's soft hand on your cheek. An arrow of starlings fired from the windbreak's thatch. The glitter of dew that stays where it is and steams all day. And horses in the distance standing rigid and still as toys. All nodding. Electric sounds of insects at their business. Ale-colored sunshine and pale sky. And whorls of cirrus so high they cast no shadow. Insects all business all the time quartz and chert and schist and chondrite, iron scabs and granite. Very old land. Look around you. The horizon trembling, shapeless. We are all of us brothers. My biggest hope for the publication of The Pale King is that the book will be read as fiction, that the characters, even the one called David Foster Wallace, who figures prominently, are read as characters in a novel not as symptoms in a psychiatric report. Chances are that the text will be combed for clues to the author's mental turmoil, treated as a gloss on the tragedy. Certainly, since the suicide, much of the commentary on Wallace has focused on his mental state. But even the stories and parts of novels that explicitly explore depression are always about much more. The title character of The Depressed Person is a monster of neediness, blind to the needs of others. The suicide of good old Neon is obsessed with appearances and how he'll come over right to the point of no return and beyond. Though intensely aware of the hypnotised comfort and obliviousness of self-obsession, Wallace's work urges us to pay passionate attention to life, to risk empathy with others. I mean, I'll reveal my own bigotry and say this isn't Sylvia Plath. Wallace's lifetime friend, Mark Costello. This isn't someone who has created this work around this sort of a melancholy, a fairly small melancholy. This is someone who created something I think almost joycey and really. So people have to be very reductive indeed if in the end they spend time with his books and it ends up being about the last 45 minutes of his life. But I do know that, you know, I mean, it is there. He did hang himself. That's part of the story. To me, the thing that's sort of urgent is that he himself spoke out against the medicalization of sort of how it feels to be alive. I mean, uh, he talked about depressed person, which is a story that people who want to talk about Dave as the patron saint of the depressed, they should go read that story and how it eviscerates the sort of cult of depression. And it basically is arguing for the, that we must have something that's beyond all this terminology, and that's pain and life. The idea that he could be summed up as a depressed person he didn't want that. Depression was the trade wind, you know, that kind of blew across his map. There's no doubt about it. But we are not wholly made by circumstance. We can make 75-word sentences that contain everything in the world. Uh, to me, that's why you should hold on to the books. I think it's a strong legacy. I really do. Don DeLillo. I think the man and his work were unique. I can't think of anyone quite like him at all. And when people list writers... He was thoughtful, intense, and entirely dedicated to the seriousness of his craft. 
well, if you talk to a fiction writer, you're going to get a prejudiced view. There's something magical for me about literature and fiction, and I think it can do things not only that pop culture can't do, but that are urgent now. One is that by creating a character in a piece of fiction, you can allow a reader to leap over the wall of self and to imagine himself being not just somewhere else, but someone else in a way that television and movies that no other form can do. Because people, I think, are essentially lonely and alone and frightened of being alone. At the time of that interview, David Foster Wallace had published two books in the US, a novel, The Broom of the System, written when he was still a student, and a brilliant collection of short stories, Girl with Curious Hair. In 1996, Wallace more than fulfilled his early promise when he produced Infinite Jest, a thousand-page encyclopedic novel that came trailing clouds of glory and 388 endnotes. Moving between a tennis academy for the elite and a halfway house for the desperate, the novel is set in a near-future capitalist dystopia where even the years have been sponsored by corporations, the year of the whopper, for instance, or the year of the depend adult undergarment. Infinite Jest attempted nothing less than to survey the addictions of an entire culture, to television, to alcohol, and to prescribed and non-prescribed pharmaceuticals of every variety. Above all, Wallace addressed his great theme, the self-consuming solipsism of a culture crying out for community. One of the really American things about Hal is the way he despises what it is he's really lonely for. This hideous internal self, incontinent of sentiment and need, that pules and writhes just under the hip-empty mask and hedonia. Note 281. This has been one of Hal's deepest and most pregnant abstractions, one he'd come up with once while getting secretly high in the pump room. That we're all lonely for something we don't know we're lonely for. And to explain the curious feeling that he goes around feeling like he misses somebody he's never even met. Without that universalizing abstraction, the feeling would make no sense. In the years that followed his epic work, Wallace would self-consciously downsize, in scale, though not ambition, producing two innovative, darkly funny and disturbing collections of short fiction, brief interviews with hideous men and oblivion, and two collections of essays and journalism that won him a wider audience but retained much of his singular style, a combination of streetwise slacker ease with arcane references and scholarly appendages, recursive loops and linguistic curlicues, all buttressed by his signature footnotes. Rick Moody. There's always a way in Wallace to take whatever's just been said and to kind of subdivide it and then probe at the fragments that, that are sort of underneath. And to me, that's what the footnoting's about. No thought is complete until eight more subheadings are appended to it in some way. A few years ago, I wrote a literary history of America. I stopped at the generation before Wallace's, the generation of Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo. As all literary scholars perhaps should, I allowed myself a pregnant pause before advancing any further, a chance for posterity to do its thing. But I was convinced that in any subsequent account of American writing, the work of David Foster Wallace would loom large. Along with many others, I looked forward to tracking the development of this most intrepidly adventurous of writers. And, along with many others, I was shocked and dismayed when, in 2008, Wallace, who we learned had suffered from depression for years, hanged himself at the age of 46. The loss of the finest writer of his generation has meant that Wallace's work is being poured over with accelerated attention and urgency. Posterity has been induced. The reputation will be the focus of even more intense attention in April, when his unfinished novel, The Pale King, is published. It's hard to think of a recent serious novel that has been more eagerly anticipated. How The Pale King will affect that reputation is difficult to foresee, but what seems certain is that Wallace, even in his last moments, wanted to ensure that at least some of the novel he struggled with for many years would see the light of day. He certainly left a manuscript sitting on his desk in his office so that it would be found. Wallace's agent, and now literary executor, Bonnie Nadell. While some writers, like Kafka, seem determined that their unpublished work will perish with them, 
This was emphatically not the case here. He had told his wife, destroy things that you don't think are any good. It wasn't destroy everything. It was destroy things if you don't think they're good. When Karen and I started going through his office, which was the garage next to his house where they lived in Claremont, I mean, first of all, it was the spookiest, most haunted room I think I've ever been in in my entire life. It just felt awful to be there and to be doing what we were doing. And we were so shell-shocked at the time. But, I mean, we both knew that we'd found a manuscript and we'd found pages. And then we started opening up these plastic containers that he used to keep books and notes and manuscripts and notebooks in. And we just kept finding more and more and more pages. But, I mean, the first batch, which was about 200 clean typed pages, were very much sitting on the desk. If there could have been a spotlight on them, you know, to say, here it is, there would have been, but it was sort of everything but that. Much of the media attention around Wallace has, understandably, if regrettably, focused on the grim fact of his suicide and the depression that led up to it. But Wallace is far too various a writer to be medicalised. His work is too complex for easy diagnosis. Wanting to get a deeper sense of the intellectual formation of the writer... I travelled to the Midwest of America, where he grew up. Wallace was the son of intellectuals, his father an eminent philosopher, Wittgensteinian and teacher of ethics, his mother a distinguished grammarian. As a boy, David was a prodigy in many ways, conducting Socratic dialogues with his father at an unfeasibly early age, and manifesting a precocious interest in logic, grammar, geometry and algebra. As your train slices through the flat landmass of Illinois, you get the peculiar sense that this most globally ambitious and cosmopolitan seeming of writers might, in a strange way, be a regional writer too. A sense that this place shaped his love of geometry, his straight angles, his very American sense of large spaces. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this train does terminate in Champaign-Urbana. All passengers will be asked to leave the train in Champaign and more buses if they're going down the line to any other station stops down the line. Once again, Rangel... I was guided around Champagne by Amy Wallace, David's sister, and the dedicatee of his first novel. Together, we toured the flatlands, town grids, and cornfields of Champagne urbana There's a sense of endless space running to the horizon. There's also sometimes, well, quite often, a very geometrical element to the space. And we know that David was very drawn to geometry, mathematics, logic. Does it predate his interest in literature? I know that David loved problems and he loved logic and he loved things that were indisputable. But I think math appealed to him because he did grow up where everything is right angles, the streets don't wind around here, you come to an intersection, it's, it's 90 degrees. He played tennis on a rectangle with very carefully cordoned off areas. I think that he realized only when he started writing and also being more engaged in philosophy and modal logic, how much geometry had been around him his whole life and how much he'd sort of ordered himself within it. Tennis is a constant in the life and work of David Foster Wallace. Infinite Jest is set, in large part, at a tennis academy whose students are stricken with performance anxieties of various kinds. A tennis ball is the ultimate body, says a character in the novel. Use well or poorly, it will reflect your own character. Ever the prodigy, Wallace himself was a highly ranked player as a youngster, and even took his first practice shots at storytelling at courtside. When David and I were kids, the Urbana Park District gave tennis lessons for kids and rapidly became clear that David was very good at tennis. Then as he grew up, he was good enough that he then became the tennis instructor. And we're standing right next to the courts where David would teach tennis lessons. But with the kids, if they resisted his attentions to the point where he became frustrated, if the kid wasn't getting it, he would threaten, look, you, you fluff that shot one more time and you're going to have to hear my life story. Then they would sit under, I believe it's this very tree, and David would tell a chapter of his life story. And it, it did then become apparent that this was sort of counterproductive as a strategy. 
and the kids enjoyed sitting under the tree and hearing about David's improbable life story. I, I don't know if he's ever told them anything true or not. In terms of region, we're in what I believe meteorologists term Tornado Alley, where it must have been pretty hazardous to play tennis. David writes of Midwestern life being, quote, informed and deformed by wind. What are your memories of this? <laughs> well, that's certainly true. There's nothing much to buffer the wind. Tornado season runs anywhere from probably March through September. Tornado sirens never went off at some civilized hour. It would always be one or two in the morning. David was fascinated by tornadoes. When the tornado sirens would go off, you're supposed to go down to your basement, but my parents, being Easterners, did not buy a house with a basement. So when the sirens would go off, we'd, we would huddle in a hallway downstairs, and you're supposed to sit there till you get the all clear with your little battery charged radio. And David would jump up and go outside and look around at my mother. Get back here, David. And he, he would, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll see it before it picks me up. In an early autobiographical essay, Wallace records the recreational hazards of playing tennis in tornado country. Then the whole knee-high field to the west along Kirby Avenue all of a sudden flattened out in a wave coming toward us as if the field was getting steamrolled. Antitoy went wide west for a forehand cross, and I saw the corn get laid down in waves and the sycamores in a copse lining the ditch point our way. I seem to remember whacking a ball out of my hand at Antitoy to watch its radical west-east curve, and for some reason trying to run after this ball I'd just hit. <laughs> 